So if you can start to see everything in your life as a form of initiation and full-heartedly embrace the suffering to the point where the fear of the suffering actually diminishes and diminishes and diminishes, and your surrender, the surrender of that suffering and the resistance behind the suffering is given back to source, back to God, surrendered, then this happens very quickly. And there's no better tool than suffering for this. Now, you don't have to create more suffering for yourself deliberately in order to do this. If you pay attention, you don't need as much suffering. So I encourage the first type of approach to suffering for reasons of accelerating your focus, your meditative um, alignment, and so forth. Uh, on the whole, I recommend the second understanding of suffering, which is understanding its place instead of demonizing it, really understanding its place. Um, also in the relative workings, not only as inspiration to go absolute, but also as inspiration for the soul to be of service, to use it as a tool for purification. And I liked, they said one of the, one of the, um, what is it? Not mottos, but of the brothers and sisters of sorrow is let me become empty. So first of all, your incarnation itself, let me see how much time. Your incarnation itself is uh, painful, just a process of being born. And um, so that's already sacrifice, especially if you don't necessarily have to incarnate. It's already sacrifice to choose to incarnate. It's the biggest sacrifice. Because not only are you subjecting yourself, very much like the first portion that I read, to all the pain and the, um, the physical distress, the confusion, and the subjection to others and the physical helplessness and stuff, especially in the first few years. That whole journey, like of knowing that, okay, it's going to, it's going to take me like 10 to 20 years to even get on my own feet to start with, like to get started. Up to that point, it's just a big gamble. Like I'll get whatever I'll get. And of course you program certain things and you are aware of certain probabilities, but still there's a lot of randomness even within that. And there's a lot of fluctuations in your life path. So, and you don't know for sure yet how you're going to respond to that. You can put all the guidance in place for your incarnation, but there might be a reason why you decide not to pay attention or you decide, decide to stay resistant to the messages and, and not wake up to why you came. So it is also the risk of forgetfulness. Um, well, it's a given that you'll forget, but that you'll never pick back up the path of awakening and service as to why you came here, which I think is the case for most of you guys. You didn't just come here for yourself, for your own, out of the necessity to learn. I think if you're part of this program, you're most likely attracted to this because you are of a wandering nature, as they say, meaning you came here to be of service. And so now you're awakening and you're remembering. So even just that, like consider that the fact that that's what you chose with all the risks involved, with all the randomness involved, with all the forgetfulness and the pain and the limitation and subjection involved. And just pause for a moment to start there because that's where your current journey started. That's what you chose. And just see if you can get in touch with the plays once you chose that. What state did you choose that from? To go for another merry-go-round in this amusement park <laughs> of feigned suffering, old age, and helpless childhood. <laughs> what state must you have been in to be so besides yourself and so not in your right mind <laughs> that you chose this? Again, when there, for some of you, or maybe even all of you, there was no actual need for it. 
So out of, let's just assume that for a moment, even if it's not true for everyone, but let's assume it is true for everybody. If you chose it when there was no need for yourself, so it wasn't automatic, it wasn't like you have to, because it's your own level of learning, but you chose to because you felt the calling and the opportunity to be of service, just picture what kind of sort of state or environment or density or love or light you'd have to be bathed in to be so foolish. What did that feel like when you were optimistic? <laughs> the thing about love light too is like it forgets suffering very quickly. It forgets the intensity of it. You know, like half a day later or whatever, like you're fine. Nothing happened. It's good. I feel great. <laughs> so you forget what it's like when you're inner because it's a different state. So similar when you're not incarnate, you kind of forget what it's like. <laughs> That's why I say you're not in your right mind. You're, you're gullible, naive, loving, uh, foolish. Or you could say courage. So, yeah, just in a sense, appreciate where you come from and put your life in context to where you came from when you make that decision. Because often, you know, what would be worse than, okay, you've already chosen it, it's too late now, can't go back, can't crawl back into your mom. I know a lot of guys would love to, <laughs> energetically, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> give me that womb. <laughs> but, but, so it's too late, you know, you can't go back. You're here. But the reason that you chose this, the intention, the state from which you chose this, if now you're not going to live up to that intention, if you're not going to resist it, wouldn't that be even worse? Like a wasted opportunity in a way. Of course, it's not totally wasted because you'll learn what you learn and all that stuff. And your vibration is still emanating. It's still helping. But just from a more personal point of view, like a personal accomplishment point of view almost, it's like, wouldn't it be so much better to just take the reins of this incarnation and live it according to the intention that gave literal birth to it? It didn't exist. You created this incarnation. It didn't exist. You created it out of thin air, out of the materials of this dimension that were available to you. You created this incarnation. You shaped it. You intended it. You created it. It didn't exist. It's not like an empty slot. Oh, who's going to take it? No, you created it. Does that make sense? Okay, and then there was a slot, but the slot was created. The parents, the circumstances, all that was created. But a lot of us are, and that is also to be accepted. That's part of the sorrow, and that's part of what we need to have compassion for in ourselves. But not compassion in the sense of complacency. I know the words kind of look alike, but they're not the same thing. So we got to have compassion for the fact that in some situations or states of mind, we are in resistance to why we created this in the first place, right? So we're battling ourselves, which makes sense because nobody likes discomfort. Nobody likes pain. Nobody likes abuse. Nobody likes fear. Nobody likes to have to play a large game, maybe in some cases, um, if it comes with all kinds of uncertainties and other fears and so forth. So we got to accept that, the fact that we have become limited beings in our thinking. We have to have patience for that. Also, like Quo said, or Aaron, I don't know. The importance of patience. Um, and you asked me about patience, right? Yeah, so you can also refer back to that answer. It's like I'm not really a patient person, per se. I don't think I would be where I am had I been a patient person. And so I don't perceive anything wrong with my perfectionism. I don't perceive anything wrong with my impatience. I don't perceive anything wrong with my passion with my romanticism, with my full onness. Um, I don't perceive anything wrong. I think it's beautiful. I love it. I think it's got me where I am. It's got this work to be where it is. And it allowed me to be a channel, as they say, for this. So, And similarly, you have all these personality traits. 
But it's important to turn them into your gifts, to not make them wrong. I think Bruce Lee also said once, in order to control myself, I first have to accept myself. And if I want to accept myself, I first have to, I'm paraphrasing, but I have to not fight who I am. I have to go with what I am. I have to go along with what I am. That includes everything we judge as deficiencies and so forth. Does this make sense? You want to first go with the flow, like Aikido style, like go with that flow, don't oppose it. Go with the flow, understand it, accept it, and then you'll be able to purify whatever distortions might be there, whatever ignorance might produce egotism that then hijacks the original intent for your incarnation by filling it up with all these ran randomness things. So uh, that's why I appreciate perfectionism and passion and going for it no matter what and so forth. Because it allows you to see so much more. It allows you to see so much more of the game. Anyway, but you have your own personality traits. It's not just about those. Those are just mine. Uh, but I'm not a patient person as a person. And I love that and I wouldn't change it for the world. I'm never going to be a patient person, I don't think. I think that'd be detrimental. Um, but I am also God. And God doesn't see difference. So in that non-differentiation, there's no, nothing to be impatient with. There's no one to be impatient about anything because there's no right or wrong. There's no success or failure. There's no you or me. So we want to bring us, become as transparent as we can to God's love, to God's total isness. And the way to do that is to become empty. And the way to become empty is to suffer, to hurt yourself which is what suffering is, is you hurting yourself. There's no way around it, really. From a cosmic point of view, from a higher self point of view, even from a physical point of view, in some ways, you are hurting yourself. So why do you hurt yourself? What's the purpose of it? And let's not demonize it. Let's not make it wrong. Let's actually use it. Let's use that energy of suffering, it's use that energy of challenge, of intensity, of catalyst, and use it as a purifying fire. And I like the word initiation that they use. So if you can start to see everything in your life as a form of initiation and full heartedly embrace the suffering to the point where the fear of the suffering actually diminishes and diminishes and diminishes, and your surrender, the surrender of that suffering and the resistance behind the suffering is given back to source, back to God, surrendered. Then this happens very quickly. And there's no better tool than suffering for this. Now, you don't have to create more suffering for yourself deliberately in order to do this. If you pay attention, you don't need as much suffering. Literally, if you were to do what you want to establish in yourself, if you paid attention more, and this takes training and subtlety and intuition and learning. But the more aware you become of what your higher self wants of you next, thy will, what is thy will? You can begin to observe the, in a sense, absurdity of whatever you desire that's not that. And see how it's a contradicting flow to your higher self's true desire or God's desire, if you will. If you can learn that way, you can correct yourself. You don't have to continue in this selfish direction because you believe something, because there's a delusion, but you really don't want to let go of it because if you let go of it, then your fulfillment disappears. And da, da, da. But if you go in that direction, continue, then there's no other way for you to course correct but to pull a full stop on yourself, a.k.a. catalyst, suffering, intensity, dr drama, um, whatever, you know, Betrayal, abandonment, uh, diseases, all these things. So if you can pay attention and kind of start hovering in between your personal physical mind and your higher mind, kind of be a mediator, almost like a marriage <laughs> mediator, and you're there like, okay, you listen to your higher self's desires, you listen to your personal desires, both are fine, both are valid, and see if you can harmonize that. This is wisdom. This is learning faster. So you can actually, with imagination and intuition and paying attention with self-awareness, you can course correct in a very harmonious way. You don't have to create suffering. But the suffering that is there 
not maybe even the new catalyst that you're producing, although that too, but even the suffering that's traced, the trace elements from your past, the beliefs that haven't fully resolved yet, the traumatic um, events that have occurred that you haven't fully processed yet or forgiven yet at some level, you know? So those trace elements of suffering, we can use those too to peel ourselves open more. And this takes courage, yes. But I mean, do you have a better suggestion? <laughs> Right? So you have it, you have the trace amounts of suffering left. What do you suggest? I suggest you give it up. You just give up your allegiance to it. It's, it's, it can be there, it can arise but you give up your allegiance to it. It is no longer the instructor in your life. It's no longer your swim coach. You're going to swim wherever the fuck you're going to swim based on a new intelligence that's unblocked. It's the willingness. The willingness brings everything to you that you need. And yes, it will still reveal the layers that you have. You're not going to escape the layers to purify. They're going to come up. And you can accelerate that process, yet make it less intense or less um, painful by doing it willingly. You already volunteered, so don't stop volunteering midway because it makes no sense. Continue to volunteer. Continue to volunteer your feelings, your emotions, your actions, your sacrifices, your love, your passion. Continue to believe in what you're here for. Does this make sense? It's just one view, but... So more and more, the more you suffer, the more you feel like, whether it's like a catalytic suffering, like it's an ouchie, you know, like a big in the moment ouchie, like, oh, fuck, I feel that. Or whether it's sort of a slow, s slowly self-destructive layering armor that kind of just like fierce this and that, and da, 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 whatever kind of form or shape or nuance of suffering it is, when you notice it, when you're aware of it, instead of making it dependent on objects. And if you look, it's always what you do when you continue to suffering, when you don't step into the willingness. Shift it from object dependency to God dependency. So what I mean by that is surrender it to God, basically, whatever it is, whether it's ouchy and in the moment slap in your face, ouch whether it's a rejection or it's a fear that's triggered by something um, or something actually happens or someone leaves you or uh, you get insulted or whatever, you know, and in the moment, ouchie, like you didn't see it coming, like, oh, shit, slap in the face. You can't avoid it. You can't strategically like, or at least not as much. Some people are very good at it, but you, not as much. It's in your face. Your body language shows it. You're exposed. You're triggered. You're in pain. It's uncomfortable. You have a perspective. You have a belief. You have a reason. Now, the reason this continues to go on and is harbored is because it's in our minds, we make it have something to do with an object or a person, which I include as object right now in this equation. Anything that kind of moves or is noticeable to you as a subject. Does that make sense? So if you look, okay, why am I holding on to this? Or why am I shying away from this? Or why am I unwilling? Or why am I afraid of the suffering? Or why am I holding on to it when I know I can let go of it? It's because you've made it object dependent in some way, situation dependent, uh, person dependent, and, and so forth. Does it make sense? So there's some dependency. There's some line going out towards something you're projecting as an object that some of this has to do with. If you can scrap all that, and throw it into the emptiness, the fire of surrendering it to God, suddenly the whole flavor of your suffering changes. Have you had this experience where it just burns off because you just surrender it and there's this big relief that comes in, almost bliss even while you still hurt? It's like a, the you know bittersweet perfection starts to shine through kind of thing and the release. So it's like that. But it happens the moment you remember to give your suffering back to God, to donate it to volunteer it back to God, to merge again with source, 
and not make it about a thing or a person or a past or a future event or anything like that, or an object or a sports car or whatever, or the best cigar in the world. <laughs> I mean, that one kind of makes sense. But <laughs> <laughs> if you notice you're holding on to yourself, huh? Did someone say no, something? Sorry, no exception. <laughs> well, yeah. Almost no exception. Yeah, the cigar comes yeah, as one. But you give it to God. And when you give it to God, the whole flavor changes. You feel unconquerable. You still feel the pain, maybe, or at least trace effects of it. And it moves through. But you feel it's the alchemizing process right now. Instead of the same sort of rusty iron burning and burning and burning, it's like, okay, the burn is still there, but you can see how it's being turned to gold. It's like there's an alchemical process at work here. There's a divinity that's starting to be revealed, that transmutes the whole experience. And suddenly you get insights of why you suffered, why you chose that, how it makes sense, and so forth, instead of opposing your own suffering and feeling bad about it and judging it and so forth. Make sense? All right. So very simple step. You just have to remember, ah, oh, fuck, I'm making it about a person. I'm making it about an object. I'm making it about a cigar. I'm making it about an event in time. I'm making it about how someone else sees me. All are objects. None of these things are God. Well, they all are God, but they're not God directly. You know what I mean? So change your relationship from objects to things, especially when you suffer. And you find your heart opens, your willingness increases, your mission readiness goes up. Your self-judgment dissolves. The bliss returns. And you're dancing again. You're dancing in your own way. You're dancing. You're flowing.